for our next talk from Elliot Newton, um, because Elliot is, um, I know Elliot from my hometown of Kingston. He's um, the biodiversity officer for the, the borough, uh, and he's, he is doing an excellent and outstanding job. Um, and okay. one of the things that I want to try and do with um, Elliot is to, to do um, a really nice survey um, of one, on one of his projects of the diptera. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, an obvious way of sampling your diptera is to do a malaise trap. But then the problem is, how do you get through all the material? Um, so. So I came across this paper at the top um, from Art Borkent uh, and Brian Brown. You probably you may recognize their names. They're, they're big movers and shakers in the fly world. Um, and they they feel they have succeeded for the first time ever in doing a sort of all species survey of a site for one of the, me the big mega diverse insect orders, in this case, the Diptera. Um, and their process was <laughs> as demonstrated at the bottom. <laughs> so this is this is why I have invited Elliot along. Elliot is going to talk about the, the site um, and the things that they're going to do there. Uh, and what I'm hoping to do is to um, run a malaise trap and um, basically Art and Brian's um, process for actually <laughs> getting through your samples was Step one, <laughs> get your taxonomic experts on, on board. And you can see these taxonomic experts are very happy with the situation. So um, I think you can you might be able to guess who those people might be, or who I hope I'm hoping they might be. Um, and step two is to um, get some pairs of hands um, to, to process the samples. And it's more than just you know running the malaise traps. It's actually speaking to the experts and asking them what what they want to receive, what they're willing to receive, and also what format they want to receive the material in, just so that you're making it easy for your experts to, to quickly um, look at the stuff um, and give you your results. So uh, they actually had, I think they had five or six parataxonomists in the, um, the paper at the top that was in Costa Rica, and they were even slide mounting material for people um, so that you know the experts at the end of the line were receiving exactly what they they needed. Um, they didn't need to do any processing of their own. It was made simple for them. Um, so I'm hoping that we, through the People's Trust for um, Endangered Species, they run an internship programme. So Elliot and I are going to put in an application and we're going to try and get um, some poor <laughs> graduate um, um, on one of these internships. I think it's six grand for six months. Um, and so we would have a person um, to process the samples and speak to you guys and ask you how you wanted to receive them and how much you were willing to look at. And we'll just see how, how much we can get through. Um, and then the stage three is actually collect your insects. <laughs> so I don't know if that's, is that helpful, Brigitte? <laughs> I think probably not, yeah. So um, enough of me, let's have um, Elliot. Elliot Newton from um, Citizen Zoo and the yeah, Borough of Kingston. Bit of a mix. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Zoe. Hopefully you can hear me at the back and uh, thank you for inviting me to talk today. And yeah, and for the premise around our, our potential um, project to work together. Um, and I suppose just to, uh, to say, I'm very much a conservationist, not a taxonomist or to, and to some extent an ecologist. So my knowledge of flies is by no means where it should be. So I feel very much uh, uh, what I want at school today, but it's been fantastic to hear the, the presentation so far. So um, I, I'm just going to give you an introduction to, to the project that we're doing in Tolworth uh, and uh, some context about it and some of our aspirations and, and how we're trying to achieve a baseline survey. Is, is, there, is that working? <laughs> there we go. Do you want the laser pointer? Oh, that sounds great. There you go. Cool. Amazing. Woo! Look at that. Cracking. Cool. So, uh, yeah, as, as I said, I am the Biodiversity Officer of Kingston upon Thames. I also wear a slightly different hat where I co help to co found an organisation called Citizen Zoo. And that sounds a bit of a strange organisation. It's not a place where you go and look at people in cages. It's, um, it's uh, an organisation where we try and empower communities to be at the heart 
of conservation projects. One of our examples of a project is with a large marsh grasshoppers. And indeed, Mark here is one of our citizen keepers and helps us to um, uh, rear large marsh grasshoppers and reduce uh, reintroduce them back into the wilds of Norfolk. And that's give you a small, exa a small example of some of the projects that citizens do. do. We also do beaver reintroductions and also looking at um, water bowl reintroductions as well. So we do lots and lots of stuff, but all about empowering communities to be at the heart of our conservation project uh, of our conservation projects. But Tolworth Court Farm is not quite as far away as the, the UAE, uh, but it uh, always hot. <laughs> but um, it's 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 um, it's Kingston upon Thames, southwest London. Um, I like to call Kingston the Florida of London, the way it sort of pokes out the bottom of the of, of 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 London. And this is our um, um, this is the sort of general area. Tolworth, has anybody really heard of Tolworth? You might have drive past it as you go on the A3 into, into, into London. It's got a beautiful tower, uh, which actually isn't very beautiful at all, but it's quite, it's quite a, uh, a, a landmark for the site. And actually the, the Evening Standard, when they were writing about Tolworth Court Farm, or Tolworth itself, they called it the Scrag End of Kingston. So it's got quite, so, <laughs> so, so, so it's got a bit of a poor reputation, but our, pro our project is trying to try and empower people to be, uh, uh, acknowledge the green spaces that we have and, and get people outside and, and, and try and make a truly outstanding nature reserve. And this is, this is the general area of the nature reserve. Um, it's our, by far our largest nature reserve that we have in the borough. We have 12 nature reserves and this one is 43 hectares in size. So for a London site, it's not too bad when it comes to, to comes to size. And also its location is incredibly important. You can see here, there's a sort of green line. That green line uh, follows the banks of the Hogsmill River. And the Hogsmill River is a fantastic river. It's one of our sort of 260 odd chalk streams that we have. Uh, across the world. So it's right on the banks of the Hog Hogsmill there. And being part of that green corridor there is really fantastically placed to be part of a, a core part of our, uh, uh, of our uh, sort of a, a green chain, a green link. And so it really can contribute to the wider landscape. And this is a, this is a view of it from above, hopefully, maybe. There we go. Um, so as you can see, uh, it's, it's it's a series of field systems, really. Uh, it's got some lovely hedgerows, but seven seven fields. And uh, the Hogs Mill is just to the south there. It's actually on the very edge of the Greater London border. So just on the other, other side of the Hogs Mill there is Surrey. So we're right on the edge of, of, of London. I think whenever we do conservation projects, we always like to understand the context of the project, not just from an ecological perspective, but also from a social perspective. And the site is actually like much of Kingston has a really interesting um, social history. Indeed, this site, this, 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 this sort of hedgerow line here is part of the old Roman road that used to go into London. So it's, good, it's, got, it's got, humans have been present on this site for over sort of 2000 years at least. And they go more into more recent history. It was mentioned in the Doomsday Book in 1086. And there was a big manor there. And the manor house was actually, uh, uh, um, has a direct relationship with William the Conqueror because William the Conqueror gave the manor to his guardian, which was quite an interesting sort of um, uh, link in social history. And you come, yeah, and, and, yeah, and then, um, it's changed hands many times. Surbiton, which is close to Tolworth, actually had one of the last um, uh, one of the last sort of battles in the civil in the, in the in the civil war, and so actually a lot of parliamentary sort of soldiers actually settled on Tolworth Court Farm. So it's got a very interesting social history. But uh, in more recent years, in living memory, um, Kingston Council bought it from Lambeth Council in 1989. It was destined to become a cemetery, as much of London was trying to bury their dead in the outer London boroughs into Surrey. But actually, Kingston said, no, we actually don't want to become a cemetery, we want to try and protect it to become a nature reserve. So in 1992, it became a nature reserve. And um, to be honest, since then, it's been, it's been looked after from a, a, a legal protection, but it hasn't had much in the way of management apart from a haycut um, every, every uh, so often. And the, the site is also surrounded by some incredible buns. And that's because in 2001, there was a five day rave that took place on site. Um, and a lot of the volunteers that actually we, uh, we have on the project are engaged, uh, uh, can remember it. <laughs> Some of them were involved with it. But to try and prevent those sort of things happening again, um, they created this big, it must have cost thousands and thousands of pounds, but they put a bund around the outside. But in terms of, it, but in terms of its um, status, it's, it's metropolitan open land, which is effectively the same protection as Greenbelt. 
and it's also a site of importance for nature conservation and a conservation and a local nature reserve. But it does have some issues. We are managing the site in some ways. There's a small part of it which we're doing traditionally, and with that we've got this an amazing little meadow. It's about 2.7 hectares in size, a small part, and we're doing traditional conservation management here, where we teach people to go out and scythe. We have over 40 people trained to do scything there now, which is amazing. And the best thing about that is because it's got these amazing little yellow meadow ant hills. And to sort of stop those big, big, chunky tractor driving over the ant, ant mounds, we now go in and scythe around it, which is a much, much better way of managing it from an ecological perspective. And then we also get some Sussex cattle after for about a, a month or so after the scythe to do some aftermath grazing. And this is a very small part of the site uh, where we're sort of trying to celebrate our traditional sort of history and also do some, uh, some, some traditional conservation work. But for the larger site, we're trying to sort of, can we embrace a rewilding vision? And rewilding is a name that probably sort of elicits a lot of um, responses in people. It can mean a lot of things to a lot of, a lot of different people. Um, I imagine you're all familiar with the term and it probably means a slightly different thing to each one of you. The word actually arised in sort of the early 90s by a guy called Soul and Noss in the American context, where they were looking at the large sort of areas such as Yellowstone, where they had these big cores and corridors, and wanted to introduce things like wolves as carnivores and see how that, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, to try in, to try put forward a trophic cascade to try and enable these landscapes to become self-willed landscapes by nature at the, at the steering wheel, well, rather than being a, uh, a an area where is is very much managed in a more traditional sense. But obviously, since that time, rewilding has grown many legs and many arms. It means a lot of, and uh, is applied to many different contexts. In the, in the UK, we have now lots of different rewilding sites like NEP, Wild Ken Hill, uh, Coombs Head in rural conditions where we, we're seeing we're seeing rewilding projects take place. But we find in the, the urban context, we actually get a lot of interest with rewilding. As Citizen Zoo, we sit on, stand, sit on the, the Rewilding London Task Force, which is part of the GLA. And we sort of like, how does rewilding apply to London? And we think it can really help in terms of a narrative and power and excite people. Because when we, when we say the word rewilding to a, a politician, a local member, a local councillor, or a local school or local business, that word tends to excite them. Where, where, where if we were going to say something like um, ecological recovery, we might sort of lose them. So we find that word in itself actually can engender hope and excitement more than some of the other more traditional conservation vernacular. So what does it mean in our context? To our context, we're trying to embrace ecosystem processes and it's only a 42 hectare site. So how we do that is going to be quite interesting. We're looking to try and use analog species. But we really want to try and maximise the site's ecological potential. But most importantly, we want to try and rewild people, reconnect the people who live around the area to, to become part of it, become, use the site in a responsible way. We did a survey just before a lockdown of 3,000 people who lived no within 10 minutes of the site. We surveyed 3,000 people, only 5% knew the site existed. So it just sort of shows you the levels of lack of ecological awareness and, and that, 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 that disconnection to nature. But most importantly, and why we're here is to talk about ecological monitoring. Um, and that was obviously essential. Without monitoring something, we can't manage it. Um, so this year we've been working with funding for the GLA with three main work streams um, and to try and get our baselines. We've done some traditional work already. We've enlisted the support of Peter Kirby, who some of you might know, um, uh, who has been doing some uh, national, uh, doing some invertebrate surveys for us. Sarah Lambert's been doing, who's a botanist, has been doing some MVC and UK HABs for us to get some baseline data. We've also been working with local groups such as the Service and District Birdwatching Society and Butterfly Conservation Trust. We've been doing uh, surveys on site for about five years now. So we've got some starting to get some longer term data. Apologies in advance, I've got lots of pictures of selfies of myself. There's a lot of ginger out there, so apologies in advance. You might need to wear some sunglasses. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so this is us going out doing more traditional surveys. Um, this is what Sarah did for us, which was great, just getting our sort of MVC classifications. Um, we did the last time this was done in 2003, and we realised the site actually hasn't changed much in that time, despite doing an annual hay cut. Um, and in the moment, in the main, it's sort of just MG1 mesotrophic grassland with not much in the way of um, interest. It's more um, just sort of Yorkshire fog. Uh, uh, sort of grass that so hasn't got much in the way of botanical interest, apart from this field down here, which has slightly more interest, uh, which is more sort of MG5 sort of characteristics. Um, that like gives us a lot of botanical sort of interest, but this is the only sort of species we found of any sort of note from a botanical perspective this year, which was sort of yellow vetchling, which is a nationally scarce species. Um, but Peter did a great job as well. In just four days of surveying, he found he surveyed uh, recorded 780 species 
which is not bad, um, including uh, longhorn white band, uh, longhorn band white band beetles, uh, resin, large headed resin bees uh, with tree ants, um, uh, brown tree ants, sorry. And the site is amazingly good for uh, blackthorn. The, the hedgerows are full of, um, uh, uh, especially this, well, as we're going into winter, uh, brown hair streak eggs. So in one, 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 just in a winter alone, we recorded over 100 um, uh, brown hair streak eggs, which is pretty exciting. Um, We've also been trying to adopt more sort of scientific uh, uh, sort of uh, technological approaches. We worked with these guys called Carbon Rewild, where we employed bioacoustic sensors across the site to try and get an understanding of our, uh, of our more of our fauna. And we've got some really nice data like this, which is sort of 41 bird species, as well as sort of some bat species as well, which have helped contribute to our sort of ecological baseline understanding. We get these sort of nice graphics, which give us a good understanding, not only of the presence, but maybe can give us some sort of into, look into, to, to, uh, uh, we start to look into to abundance as well, to some extent. Um, but most, we've also been working really well with the Field Studies Council this year. Martin Harvey's very kindly been over to the site as well. Uh, we've been getting local people to get involved in, in surveying. So we've got various taxonomic experts who've come to the site and we've invited the community down. Um, so every time I do a photo, I like people to look very silly, so I get them to put their arms in the air. So over the course of this year, we've had over 100 local people come to the site and they've been led under the experts of various taxonomic um, uh, uh, sort of expertise. And we've gone out to survey species and we've recorded over over 159 species just with this sort of process but a great way of engaging the community as well so it's been absolutely amazing and some of the things that we found you know these I think you've, I think Martin found 23 different hoverfly species just in one day which I know is I know no more particularly rare but it was great 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 to have uh, uh, sort of six uh, six belted clear wing moths you know, a good example of mimicry here. I know we've been talking about it quite a lot today. We we're talking about sort of range changes, as Chris was saying earlier. The first ever record of a wasp spider on site, which was quite nice, uh, though the council quickly went to cut the grass where they were laying their eggs uh, this winter. So I'm sure we might not have them next year, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, also, a nationally scarce centipede, Henia fasubiana, which, um, which was, was one of the more rare species that we found. Um, also, doing camera trapping. Lots, as I say, it's an incredibly good site in terms of its location on the river we get lots of roe deer moving through uh, which is which is uh, has well, an interesting ecological impact um, in terms of their browsing pressures lots of foxes as you'd expect so now with that baseline we're also trying to get sort of people who do rewilding projects across the UK to over to see what they think they would do if they had 43 hectares of site in London and so we've invited people like um you might have heard of a guy called Derek Gow, who looks a bit like a beaver and uh, does a lot of beaver conservation work. He's really, uh, so, uh, so we had him on site. We had some lovely person called Sarah, who runs the Rewilding um, Britain Network. Um, uh, and so this is the first site in London, or the first site in the UK, where we have an urban rewilding site, which is pretty exciting. And this guy down here is a lovely chap called Dom, and he's, he, he, he uh, helps to run Wild Ken Hill in Norfolk. So he's been over to have a look. Um, uh, and we're all giving their ideas about what they would do with these spaces. So we're just trying to see what is possible. We also had who I think is one of the sort of founding fathers of conservation and rewilding, uh, rewilding uh, in the UK context, George Monbiot, over to have a to get his thoughts, which was quite exciting to see what he would do with the site. And all these people have said this site could be great, uh, but most importantly is how it can how it can rewild people as well. So it's some really really interesting things. The Hogsmore used to actually flow through Tolworth Court Farm before we used before we stupidly colonised it and straightened it like we've done to many of our rivers. So we're looking to try and actually create more area of wetland um, and we've got a tiny remnant area of wetland left. So we're looking to expand that and see if we can have an online wetland system. We found some really nice sort of uh, wetland um, wood lice, which are wetland specialists in there, but we haven't got many wetland specialists uh, in terms of uh, the species that we found. So if we can expand that area, I'm sure that would be pretty exciting. Uh, so it is in the flood risk area, so the Environment Agency are keen for us to pursue a wetland expansion plan. So we're doing lots of sort of geograph uh, sort of topo topographical topographical surveys, looking at the, the clay and stuff to see how possible it is to do um, uh, stuff like this, uh, which we hope we'll sort of, which we're planning now. Um, but again, all these species, as I say, each species, as, as you know, has an amazing story to say, uh, to tell. And I think the power of this, this species helped really, I think, garner my interest in, in engaging kids in the site. So as I'm sure you're aware, this is like a, a, a tortoise beetle larva and we have them on site. And I think it has probably the most amazing way of protecting itself from predation by creating this huge 
beakle shield, a turd that is bigger than its body. And, and you go up to children and say there's these little beetle larvae that carry poos that are almost the size of their bodies to help them stop them being eaten. You get some really amazing interest. So we, we try, we're trying to just find these little stories that we can tell local people just to try and excite them about the natural world that's on their doorstep. So we're doing lots of things like getting people on site, taking do, renting out little theatres to get people excited about the project, taking them on bat walks and nature walks. And all these people didn't really know this big site existed a year ago. So we're really starting to build an interest and a vision about what this site might be able to come in the future. Um, we're also trying to use art. So Hampton Court Garden Show like this year, we had a garden there. And this garden was all about the, the interrelationship between nature and music. And there's a composer who lives in Kingston and he went out in the morning of uh, the morning and recorded all the bird sounds and created this lovely symphony of uh, composition that we played at, at Hampton Court Garden Show. So as the people walked around our small little garden there, they were hearing a sort of a symphony made of all the um, bird songs that you could hear in the morning, which is pretty nice. We're also working with local libraries every Thursday now. We take little, we have little children who show up and they are rewarding rangers and we're teaching them about little sort of um, conservation projects that they can get involved with. And it's amazing to see this sort of engagement that we've had so far. And we're doing community surveys as well, which is you know, getting people's ideas. So we can co-design and create this vision for the site, uh, which we think can be one of the truly most outstanding nature reserves in London if we play our cards right. So we want to create this sort of co-created vision and a roadmap of how to get there. And some of the species we're looking at, just to quickly, very quickly go over them, um, we're looking to see if we can try and get some more cattle on site, uh, analogues for auric in some respects, uh, and you, you know, create the micro habitats they do and the amazing things that we all know the conservation grazing can achieve when it's done in low, at low densities. We're also looking to see if we can introduce pigs on site, analogues for wild boar, where their disturbance at small, small levels, not been done much in the London context. So how we can try and do it about the pigs getting stolen would be interesting. Um, um, so, so yeah, so uh, yeah, it's something that we were looking at. Uh, white storks, well, before the reintroduction projects have happened recently, they, the last time they bred was about 14, 15. But now we're seeing lots of white stork restoration projects, um, or reintroduction projects happen in the UK. And we're seeing white storks naturally fly over Tolf Court Farm as we speak. So as they sort of naturally expand their range following their reintroductions. And um, they're not very clever birds. So what our plan is to do is to put up these big sort of pylons or well, well, uh, platforms where they can um, think that there's white storks there. So we're going to paint some uh, uh, herons. You know, you get the plastic herons next to ponds. We're going to paint, paint them white and we're going to stick them on top of a pylon uh, type platform and paint the platform with a white ring around the edge, which looks a bit like stork poo and hopefully trick some of these guys that there's some white storks there already and encourage them to call it, encourage them to settle down there, which might happen. And the site used to have glow worms as well. Um, so we're looking at, see, can we try and get glowworms back? These amazing beetles. And I don't think there's any other, well, to my mind, there's, well, this species sort of, is a sort of a, a, a true demonstration of how magic and nature interrelates. So, you know, that will engender, that can engender excitement in so many people. So we're looking to, to see what we can do about trying to potentially reintroduce them sort of onto the site. So if we could have white stalks clattering and glow, glow worms glowing in the dark. I think it could be quite an exciting nature reserve. But some of these interactions, you know, we want to we want, we want to see what, what our changes do over time to all of our communities, as well as our uh, fly communities. So um, and that monitoring is key. So if anybody would like to get involved with this project, I'd be great, very grateful. Um, thank you for listening. <laughs> OK, do we have any questions for Elliot? Everyone's looking, no? <laughs> OK. Uh, are you aware of the Green Hags Wood project in Yorkshire? What's the way about 10 years now well they, they took some arable fields and have been put, put up in their own wood pasture but the reason i'm mentioning it is that um Dipra's forum member in yorkshire diptra recorder andrew grayson uh did um surveys there for um i think maybe doing some more actually um well five years in succession and uh, i've started looking at the data to try to understand this very relation of uh as the um, vegetation develops and what comes in from the surrounding uh, countryside. So um, if we can get uh, no similar sort of data for your place, I mean, it's really uh, interesting. Thank you. 
OK, I think that's it for questions. Um, I hope this isn't an indication of how enthusiastic <laughs> people are to look at samples. So it doesn't look like we've got any questions online. So I think we're we're ready to move on to the next talk. So um, do you want to? <laughs>